Joining me now from Vatican City is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN's Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, thank you for taking a moment to join us during this solemn week, this solemn day. Could you tell us what has it been like in Vatican Square these past couple of days? Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's been, you know, it's been a sad occasion actually that brought us all together here. The the thousands of pilgrims coming here to Rome and saying saying their farewells to Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. At the same time, it's also been a very hopeful, a very inspiring time, also for myself to see all those many people whose lives were very much influenced, as they told me in many interviews that we led here in St. Peter's Square, they, they said that Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI was very, very important to them. That's why they wanted to pay their reverences. That's why they also wanted to say farewell to this great pope, to this great teacher also, but also to this great human person. Mm. And speaking of the crowds, can, can you tell us how many people have traveled to the city to pay their respects at this point? Well, the statistics that we've heard from, from the Holy See Press Office is like more than 200,000 people have uh, really come to, to, the, to, to the Pope lying in state inside St. Peter's Basilica, paid their reverences, said their farewell, said their goodbye, said a quick prayer. It was a very solemn, solemn mood, atmosphere inside the Basilica also. I, I had the opportunity to go in there several times, and I, I really cherish those moments as well, saying my own goodbyes to Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, but then also seeing all those people who found s corners inside the Basilica where they knelt down, prayed the rosary, and, um, and there were many tears also wept for a great pope. Mm, so beautiful. What a testament to his legacy. And, and will you share with us just a few details of the ceremony that took place this morning? Sure. So the funeral, um, it was a simple funeral after three days of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI lying in state in, in, in the basilica. I say simple because those are also the words that Matteo Bruni, the spokesperson of the Holy See Press Office, used for describing this funeral. There were only two state delegations. Germany, of course, where, where Pope Emeritus is from, and then Italy, who sent their official delegations. At the same time, we know that there was also the Portuguese president, many others, heads of state who came here to, to, to say goodbye to Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. And it was a it was a beautiful mass, a solemn mass, uh, with many people from all over the world participating in it, and with Pope Francis, of course, presiding over the mass, also giving the homily, saying farewell to Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, and then bringing the the coffin uh, with the, with the Pope Emeritus inside, back into the basilica, down uh, where where he's now laying in his in his tomb there. Thank you for sharing those details. And, and one final question, Andreas. As our Vatican Bureau Chief, you have followed Pope Benedict's life very closely, surely closer than most of us. When you think of his legacy, what will you remember the most about our Holy Father in the years to come? I think that he was a great, uh, a great theologian, somebody whose legacy on the, on the really the theological thoughts and ideas that he had uh, will, will yet be discovered in, in, in the years to come. He was very, very influential also with his writings in my personal life. I benefited greatly from his insights, especially how he, how he focused his ideas, his thoughts on Jesus Christ, bring, and making him approachable, really, uh, to me as well and, and, and to, to many of my friends. I, I also always appreciated how clearly he was on topics like marriage, on topics like the right to life. He was a pope that really defended the human person and wrote a lot about it, how our faith in God really makes us human and makes us also human towards the next, uh, towards our neighbors and other human beings. So this is, I think, part of his legacy. Well, thank you for sharing all of that with us, Andreas, and for your always excellent reporting from the Vatican. Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. God bless you. To continue this discussion, we're joined now by Father Thomas Petrie, President of the Dominican House of Studies. Father, thanks for joining me today. Let's talk about Pope Benedict's legacy. You know, he was beloved by more than just Catholics. Many people on, you know, across the spectrum, many Christian denominations understood um, that he was really a visionary. And he 
had a lot of predictions about how modern technology and the increasingly secular culture would impact and change the world. Talk to me about that. Well, you know, he understood, of course, the first and primary reason for Christian existence is to come to know and love Jesus Christ, right? And when he started to see how the modern world was moving towards a more technological, or we might use the word even technocratic, that technology is the way to make our lives better and improve our lives, he understood that all of that will eventually serve first to distract from the true purpose of life, which is knowing and loving Jesus Christ, but also could in fact um, denigrate the human person. And we see where we are today, uh, nine years after his resignation, you know, with his death, but we see that the world is at a place where science and technology, people deny the intrinsic dignity of the human person, they deny the intrinsic orientation of the human body, right. because technology can be used to manipulate the human body and, uh, and, and the person. Mm, it's very troubling. And, you know, Pope Benedict also spoke with clarity in defiance of abortion. In one instance, he said, quote, everyone must become aware of the intrinsic evil of the crime of abortion. In attacking human life in its very first stages, it is also an aggression against society itself. Can you elaborate for us what he meant there? Well, like every pope before him and certainly Pope Francis after him has understood that the, the human person and the family especially is the cell of human society. And once you begin to turn on the infant, and for, for Pope, for pope uh, Benedict, there was no ontological difference between an infant and an unborn child. They are the same person. Um, and so once you begin to turn against the infant and the child of the family, it, it fundamentally fundamentally yields to a breakdown of the family and the importance of the family for society. Right, right. And perhaps Pope Benedict's most famous work was Jesus of Nazareth. Now, this is a study of the person of Jesus Christ that revealed a lot about who he is and how Christ saved the world. Could you talk a little bit about Jesus of Nazareth and the context in which Pope Benedict wrote this? Well, this was a project for most of his life, which was the right interpretation of Scripture, you know, over the last 150 years, what came to the fore in the interpretation of Scripture, scripture from many scholars, even Catholic scholars, was what's known as the historical critical method, in which you isolate various books or passages of the Bible, and you try to figure out, well, what did the human author initially mean, and what was going on in the cultures? And he, found, he felt that while there can be value to that, it ends up relativizing revelation, you know, making experts the, the, the determining factor of what God meant with, uh, with revelation. Mm -hmm. So with his, pro, his point of biblical interpretation was to, yes, use these historical critical methods but always with an eye to interpreting Scripture with other Scripture, with the fathers of the church. And so in his Jesus of Nazareth trilogy, he brings that understanding of Scripture to bear to show, yes, the modern historical critical methods of now analyzing text and their origins can be helpful, mm -hmm. but are only beneficial if they're brought into dialogue and relationship with how the church has always taught and understood these same scriptural texts. So he wasn't afraid of modern interpretations, but he also wanted modern interpretations to be respectful of the true magisterial teaching about who Jesus is, what the church is, and what scripture is. Mm, very interesting. Thank you so much for explaining that, what a giant Pope Benedict was, and thanks for joining us, Father Thomas Petrie. Thank you, Prudence.